start from given the fact of God's existence, what has he disclosed about reality, if he has anything, which may speak about angels? And in fact, he has in the, in the gospel, in the Quran and other places. So his, angels' existence is epistemologically certain given God's reliability as a maximally great being who gives omniscient and true information. But if we start from our individual consciousness, like you're doing, it doesn't get us very far. We kind of walk two little steps. And then all of these dimensions, all this metaphysical reality, uh, it's like putting ourselves up by our bootstraps. You can't get there because we're starting from the wrong place. If we start from somewhere else, we'll get to that destination. Where I think we agree. I think I'm coming from a phenomenological position. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. Uh, Heidegger, that kind of thing, Husserl, I think, that you start with what you can be certain of and you work outward because you understand that you will deceive yourself and you pursue self-consistency as best you can. Mm. And then hopefully it leads you to more complicated conclusions and axioms that you can have some faith in, such as your faith or another faith and belief in various disciplines, scientific and whatever. But I do start, I come at it phenomenologically. You're coming at it from what I can describe as an article of faith. You're starting with an article of faith, and that's fine. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it's right. I don't think it's an but article of faith. Methodologically, method, no. not, I'm not framing this no, I, I, For me, it's not an article of faith. It is a fundamental fact, a reality of existence. God's, God's existence is the a priori reality from which all other lesser realities are created. Uh, and, so, and I also think I would challenge your phenomenology there because the existence of I, of the self, has been challenged all over the place by modern neuroscience, psychology, which even questions the, the existence of a, an I, a subjective I, that exists through time. So even your certainty now, your Cartesian certainty, has broken down in the light of uh, very hostile um, critiques from you know, postmodern deconstructionalism and stuff like that. But the belief in the, the reality of God as the, uh, the uncaused cause, the fundamental fact of existence, remains intact because we're not starting from our own fractured questionable self we're starting from the the metaphysical absolute and from that acknowledging that fact then we can learn things about unseen realms we can learn about the sins of angels which has been the the trigger for our conversation do angels exist how do we know angels exist i know they exist because the maximally great being who is called god who is perfect and has all knowledge has told us about this unseen realm along with the Day of Judgment, uh, the existence of demons, uh, uh, historical figures that I've never encountered before, a whole, ra a whole range of information which this being has accurately and infallibly communicated to us as a species. Um, so I don't start from my own fractured question self, which may not even exist according to many Western thinkers. I start from the unchanging, perfect ground of our being, also known as God. I think it's a great it's a, it's a great place to be to have faith in God rather than faith in a a self which is actually being questioned in the West now does it even exist I, th I think uh, and, and that will be many neuroscientists would say there is no self anymore I think faith is essential in any epistemology and if atheists don't seem to understand that but there's not a scientist in the world whose act, core axiom isn't something they have faith in and then they build up. So I'm not trying to knock faith. I think it's a matter of placing your faith at the optimum locus, yeah? most strategically and most honestly. Where do you make your statement? <clears throat> what you're saying to me still sounds like you are making an assertion of faith as your core axiom, and that's fine. But you're, you're talking about ontology and I'm talking about methodology. Within an ontological framework, you're correct, because what you're discussing would be the absolute ontological first principle and everything will follow from that and your description's correct. I'm investigating the methodology by which we reach that point. And I'm asserting that what you are making is an article of faith, and that may be a good thing, because we've all got to make them. What do you mean by fa an article of faith? What do you mean by that? An argument from faith. It means that the very first... Everyone's got to have a first axiom that they're going to believe before they can proceed to a more complex true. series of inductions and deductions. I'm with you yes. on that. Um, scientists and so on. Yeah, and that's true. the article of faith which you seem to be placing as your core axiom is that the Quran is sacrosanct and accurate on an ontological level. I think the thing I can be most certain of methodologically is that existence is occurring. When you just describe the fact that we queried in the West whether there is an I or whatever, mm. you're quite, that's why I didn't phrase it that way. I didn't say I even know, I don't know if I'm an I, I don't know if I'm a we. 
my level of certainty, my core axiom is experience is occurring. Maybe I'm dreaming, maybe I'm a multiplicity, but there ain't nothing happening. Something is occurring at a qualia level. So you just said, to interrupt, you said you might be dreaming, uh, yeah. a, a bit, but that would undermine your premise that your, your feelings are this certainty that give you epistemic certainty, and now from that you you move out into other things. If you know the brain and the vat thing, you know, in philosophy, or you could be dreaming now. If you are dreaming now, then you're not actually having these experiences in the real world. In that they are uh, a byproduct of your imagination while you're asleep. So how can you be certain, given what your own point here, for those two objections, that you are having uh, uh, real experiences, objective, and not just the byproduct? I, 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 so you can't. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. cutting deeper than that. Right. I'm trying to because your it doesn't point, give you certainty. Though. Your point's exactly valid. Correct. Mm. But you're talking about how accurately can I interpret my experience, and I'm saying I'm cutting deeper than that. All I'm saying is I'm certain I am having experience. Before I can interpret what it is, and I will always be fallible in that, I have to acknowledge I am having it. So qualia is occurring and inevitable. What's qualia mean for everyone? Qualia would be a property of a subject as opposed to an object. Examples being feelings, instincts, thoughts, um, emotions, mm. predispositions, hopes, dreams, pain, pleasure. All of the things that you assume this pad hasn't got, but I know I have, I'm certain I have, and I'm almost mm. certain you have, yeah? In other words, the stuff that counts, the stuff that gives teleology yeah. and morality and okay. all the importance. If I could respond, I think the basis of your well, you, you it, it's not certainty. You have feelings, but you, you can't be certain the feelings you're having are not actually the imagination uh, working in a dream state. In other words, you could be dreaming you're having these feelings. So we're, we're experiencing heat from the sun here now. It's possible that actually you, you are in a cold room back in February, or in, in February, uh, a, a dreaming you're a speaker's corner during a heat wave. So y your feelings in that case are not a reliable guide to what's actually going on. It could just be a fiction that you're... you're mo and, and secondly, the, the famous experiment of the, the, the brain in the vat. So an evil genius is manipulating our brains to, uh, to, to make us believe in, uh, in, in, in an illusion, obviously, that we are having various states of experience. So whatever experience you could say could be uh, j j just triggered uh, in, in, uh, by an evil genius who's got our brains in a vat in a laboratory. So the, the, your methodology is premised then on experiences that you can't even verify are authentic because the experience itself is quite different. If you're experiencing heat from the sun but you're actually lying in bed in February during the winter, you can't say that's just experiencing the heat of the sun analogous in any way to our actual experiencing the heat of the sun now in August. You, you may think that they're not the same experience. One is wholly illusory, without, we're devoid of any objective content back in February. This one, which I'm taking is real, <laughs> um, is real because we're going to get sunburned if we're not careful. And we're going to experience real consequences. So I think your um, easy acceptance of the intrinsic identity of these two different things as ex just as experience is questionable as well because one could be false another one could be so one could be false or they could be true I'm really trying very hard to express that I understand any diagnosis I give or interpretation can be wrong I'm not laying that as my core axiom my core axiom is that experience is occurring that's all I'm not, uh, everything that you've just said, if you were to play the tape back, I believe, were examples of how I might have misdiagnosed my experience. But I can't diagnose it until it's already on the table as a But how do you know you've misdiagnosed it? Oh, you don't, the diagnosis, now diagnosis is methodology, and now we're going deeper, and it's epistemology. No, I, I ask that not to be awkward, but because uh, it, it's easy to say, oh, X is, uh, my dream-like experience of the heat of the sun is an illusion, and we can just diagnose that. But it comes back to the question, how do we know we're asleep and we're awake, for oh, example? Very, very uh, and, and so, uh, I mean, uh, maybe you have a solution to this, but it seems to me a, a tired facile just to say, oh, well, we can, we can diagnose things as, as, as illusory, but how do we do that? I, I, I'm well, not sure how you do that. Yeah, hand in hand. How do we do that? Right, we have to do that. It's essential, and that's a lot of the hard work. But to be aware of what your core axiom is. Now, if your core axiom is a certainty in any given interpretation of your experience, it may be flawed, which is why I think Descartes, although he overstays it, um, and the mystics, what we're trying to say is experience is occurring. That's all. We're not defining it. We're not interpreting it. We're just like everyone to agree that 
the unique property of a subject is happening here, and I assume for you as well, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen to objects. If we start with that as a thing which is not cognitively certain, because it's beyond, it's pre-intellectual, yeah? it's just the imminence of subjective experience is unavoidable, mm -hmm. then the argument is how best to diagnose it. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I, I just don't think... This kind of experience that you're speaking of is a terribly reliable way, epistemologically, to gain knowledge, because it, it, it is it is uh, vulnerable to uh, critique. And the two examples I give you, these are well known, as you know, well known examples in philosophy. I'm not saying anything new here. Uh, you know, it's a standard critique of Descartes and so on. But but in terms of the existence of God, this is a pre you mentioned the, your definition of faith, and I think I would go with that. So we've got to have first principles that we accept, and I think the religious answer that. The existence of God as an a priori first principle, uh, from which we then understand uh, everything else, yes. is for me axiomatic. The existence of God is self-evident. Self um, it's, it's hardwired into our natures as a species. Uh, you know, countless academic surveys have shown that. Uh, the human race at all times and places, whether it be in secular societies or highly religious societies, children naturally believe in a higher power. They believe in God. This is it, it, the conclusion seems to be that it's it's, it's part of it is what it is to be human. Yeah. So that this is part of our nature to believe in God. Atheism is unnatural. It goes against our natures. It goes uh, it, it goes against the world we see around us, which has all these signs of. Uh, uh, of a transcendent mind having having brought this into being so that's why I would start with God and then from that methodologically flow all the other issues about the existence of angels whether or not the Quran is the word of God uh, how we live good lives you know what is the purpose of life gets answered gets addressed in that thing but to start from the uncertain principle of experience which can and cannot be illusory and we have no way I, I think of deciding from that basis what is illusory and not is a very uncertain way of living life. I don't see it as very fruitful. I, I, I totally hear you, unfortunately. I do believe that seems to be the human condition. It seems to be where I've landed. It seems to be where we've landed, and we should grapple with it. As a test, I'm happy that when religious go, when the world's religions, including Islam, say this is an important test. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have to then start trying to diagnose and understand the world around us. I'm coming in from a phenomenological perspective. I know. You're coming in stating quite correctly that if you're correct about the ontologically about God, then obviously we should all focus on that. It should be our first principle and everything from there. Exactly. Okay. And I, I, so I guess. But well, well, why, you, but, why do you object to that? I mean, I know you have your phenomenological methodology, but I, I'm I'm not quite clear I'm why trying, why, 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 why you have chosen that methodology in the first place because it seems to me not to offer much in the way of yakin certainty, whereas the metaphysical uh, grounding of our lives uh, in existence, the unchanging existence of the eternal God, the Creator, seems a much better place to, to, to oh, root oneself. I, I, and if that is the case, why haven't you done that? that that's my question well, to you. Actually, my own cognitive bias. I used to believe in miracles and I'd, I'd love to believe in God in the full-blown sense that you do. Okay. Yeah. So the appeal of that is clear to me. So, can... so well, why not then? <laughs> Because, I, I haven't given a reason why you don't. Uh, well, a lot. I mean, because my second axiom is a self-consistency principle. The first is I am. The second axiom is I'll view everything from as many different angles as possible and try to be self-consistent. And part of that is being aware of my own psychology. And the very fact that I want to believe this so much should caution me against my own cognitive bias. You know? I feel it should. Because I think honesty and truth are virtues. And religions, they... You know, they alert you to pursue truth almost above all else. Yeah? If you follow the truth, you will get to God. Now, sometimes that puts you on a path where you've got uncomfortable conflicts with how you feel and your biases. So I'm just trying to handle the truth as honestly as I can, because I think it's the best anybody can do. And I think religion um, tests you to do that. I think that's what religion is asking you to do. Have faith even when things don't make sense. So although I'm not, I'm not embracing the view that you have, I can feel the appeal of it. Yeah, you think about cognitive bias as if that's necessarily a bad thing. But for, I think from a, more, a Muslim point of view is, because we're hardwired to believe in God anyway as a species, um, this is not a bias we need to be worried about. This is something we need. Wisdom lies in recognizing the way we're made and living according to it. So I have needs and desires and understandings. To, to live by those wisely is a yes, good thing. Agreed. To see them as biases that I need to be wary of 
is uh, perhaps an unduly sceptical reserve in the face of what does it mean to live a good life? So we, we should optimistically and gladly embrace good things, especially when our bias conforms to them, because that means we're on the right track, because we're, we are made to act in certain ways. So if I, if I get pleasure from doing good things, good works, being kind to people, that's my cognitive bias. I'm not going to woo, woo, woo. And I'm not going to start worrying about that and saying, maybe I should course correct and not be good use that that positive trajectory capitalize on it develop it in healthy ways likewise the belief in god which is natural to our species i believe is a wholesome and healthy reality we need to capitalize on by using our 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 minds to actually ask those questions well who was jesus you know uh, who who were the prophets what has god actually said has he said anything to mankind so we can then investigate further into the quran the bible and so on and ask those further questions about the details of that but the fundamental orientation is a healthy one and should be affirmed and gone with like many other healthy attributes that one may have they're not biases these are these are positive instincts that we should cultivate and develop so good instincts should be followed but i don't think religious belief is a bad instinct because it's in accord with our natures and existence of god i wasn't presuming it was automatically with my bias automatically was damned i just think it's wise to be aware of your bias i didn't want to right. understand no, okay bias thing, yeah? in that sense that's a very moderate thing to say but to but but we should be cautious but i, I think we shouldn't build in caution to make it an epistemic principle such that it inhibits us from actually moving forward in our lives. I'm not running away from religion because I'm aware of my cognitive bias. That wouldn't be a good enough reason in and of okay. itself. I'm just noticing it in the balance of pros and cons. Right. I'm just okay. capturing in my, a bit of my own Okay. I think what I'm liking that we agree, I like if I'm going to agree with you as much as possible. You said it's about living well, how you live well. So I totally agree with you. I think in all of this, you need to ask yourself, what's the first question being Asked. Exactly. And I think the first question that all religion is asking and all human beings will always ask themselves is, how do I live well? How do I make a choice? Is that something we can agree on? That's an intrinsic question. It's maybe the first question to ask. It's certainly one of them. I think Islamically it would be not so much, it would be, what, what does God want of me in this situation? So we accept already the existence of God and revelation and prophets. So then we'd ask, given this situation, what does God want me to do in this situation? So it wouldn't be a more fundamental question of why am I here? Oh, that's important too. But but for a healthily functioning religious person, they should be asking what's the will of God in this situation. So they've gone beyond the does God exist phase or you know who is God phase to saying I trust that God is our Rahman our Rahim, the most compassionate, most merciful. What does He want me to do with this situation with this this elderly woman who's trying to cross the road here? What does God want me to do now? Yeah. Asking that question is is the point now, not whether or not God exists. That that that, that is something we've already agreed upon. It's not we, I mean, people generally already accept that anyway. So the question so, is, what do, what what, what, what does this God want me to do? So that your your question is. Accurate. Well, I th- no, I I, th- I think 99% of humankind have always agreed on that. Absolutely. Really? Oh yeah. I mean, Absolutely. if you draw poll the 8 billion people on the planet right now, I think you'll find it's not just 1% of them. Really I think, I think uh, well, what, what I understood, I could be wrong, that atheists make up only 1 or 2% of the global population. And the thing is, it's a diminishing, decreasing percentage of the world's population. Atheism is becoming less and less chosen by people globally now. I'm not saying there are no atheists, by the way. There have always been atheists. But I'm saying that, generally speaking, our... our humanity has been profoundly religious and even very interestingly I read a survey recently conducted by I think it was five universities some of which were in Britain and they, they questioned they did surveys of atheists self-defined atheists around the world yeah. Japan South America Finland and so on and they found that the majority of people who call themselves atheists believe in the supernatural yeah, I... they believe in angels life after death they might believe in jinn. Now they don't believe in God. Oh no, we're atheists. But we believe in all this other stuff. Now, excuse me. I mean, that strikes me as. So what, what, the point, the conclusion for me there is that the Richard Dawkins type of hardcore materialist atheists are a minority, even of atheists. Most atheists would say either there is life after death, or there are angels, or there are spirits, or whatever. 
they're not like Dawkins. So even the atheists are disagreed about what it even means to be atheist. As a wasp. I'd agree that atheists will exist on a spectrum. Yes. And that all of them need to understand they have an article of faith within their belief system, it's unavoidable. Mm. And this is something that religion can teach atheists, just so they're aware of their own mechanisms. I would be amazed if your statistic that only 1% of the planet are uh, atheists. It could be 3%. I, I don't I, be quite, I, I I, I, maybe I misquoted I that. It it's, it's a very tiny number of people in the, in, in the globe who identify as atheists. I, I would dispute what you just said, but I've got no way of proving it. And well, then, we so, could Google it now. Okay, we could, but let's not, because we're, we're, we're at the heart of things anyway. Okay, okay. I, I contextualise it. Whatever it is, it's a tiny minority of the world's population. The vast majority of the planet, and I would say even most atheists, have religious beliefs. <laughs> and I counter that by saying I don't think reality is a popularity contest. This is true. So actually, I'm really not very swayed by the numbers game or anything. In fact, generally speaking, the truth is at the cutting edge of people's understanding. And if it's entering the picture, there's very few people who have got the finger on the pulse. So what the majority is doing is nearly... Okay, no, you, 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 that, is, that is a valid point. And I, I'm not saying that uh, the majority equals correctness or truth but I was just bearing witness to the fact as I keep on saying our, our species is a profoundly religious animal uh, but this religious sense this instinct bears authentic and accurate witness to that which it has which it, which is referring to I the existence of the transcendent yeah uh, I, I think it's objectively true as well as the human experience the human experience is not wrong in this case although majority votes can be wrong in this case it is right uh, just because majorities are sometimes wrong doesn't mean they're always wrong. Agreed. Sometimes they're right. Yeah, well, no, sometimes they're very, very right. <laughs> sometimes they're very right. Sometimes they're very wrong. But on this issue of fundamental uh, of, uh, of metaphysics, the human, our human race is right. Yeah. And I think we're still seeing this, the fruit of that now, where Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Religions generally are booming everywhere on the planet, apart from here in Western Europe and in many parts of the US. But Eastern Europe, religion is very, very strong socially in Russia, China, uh, uh, Africa, South America, the Far East, everywhere religion is really uh, taken very seriously by people, apart from here. Thank goodness, thank goodness reality. Apart from Speaker's, con apart from speaker's Corner. <laughs> um, yeah. But I agree with your we're, point. We're agreeing, on, we're agreeing that human beings come with an a priori nature, yeah? And I think this is crucial. So to me, the primary, when it comes to a lot of these discussions, the primary line is between blank slate thinking and a priori thinking. Yeah? In the a priori camp sit in all the religious communities who believe in installments and so on. All the faiths have that in common. And strangely enough, if you're a Darwinian, same thing. You could you accommodate that. Yeah, yeah, you strangely could do. Enough, yeah, yeah, Sam yeah. Harris, yeah. Harris, Sam Harris, he's an atheist. Harris, yeah. Yeah, he's an atheist. But yeah. we're actually all sitting on the same side. I think in the moral battle of how to live, the primary problem is with people who would represent that there are no intrinsic values. Or yeah, I love the way you describe it—the blank slate. I think this is one of the fictions of our of our yeah. Western era yeah. that we somehow we come into the world without any beliefs, any predispositions yeah, to believe anything. Idea. It's a crazy idea. It's not. It's not true to lived experience, and and, and it has little science to back it up either. Um, yeah, so I, but that means that the, I agree. Even, even Harris is in the same camp with us thus far. I know we're going to split into it, we're going to fracture okay. it out. But it's, it's good to find the common core ideas that we share and to examine them constructively and not just do what seems to happen around speakers most of the time, which is this eternal bashing about, I mean, how many times can we do the Trinity? You know what I mean? Quite a lot, it seems. <laughs> such a shame. Actually, yeah, yeah. I appreciate your view on the Trinity, just to decide, just for a second. Just for a second. It seems to me that in Islam, you believe that God is extrinsic to creation, I think. Yeah. So he creates the universe from outside. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, when you hear about the Trinity, to you it seems crazy that something infinite has suddenly truncated itself into something small and finite. It doesn't make sense. And I can understand why. In the Christian tradition and the Kabbalistic tradition and others, we come from a Spinoza type view. We come from the view that God is intrinsic. Yeah? Now, if God is intrinsic, obviously God is in Jesus because God is everywhere. So to us, it's not so mentally jarring. It, it's illogical from your framework of God is intrinsic. 
but you don't seem to appreciate how natural and non-contradictory it is from a framework where we believe God is intrinsic. Now, I don't know who's right about intrinsic or extrinsic, but isn't that the level to have the debate at? Because that's what's underpinning the problem. Instead of this eternal thing, and I think it's rather disingenuous when people make out, they can't wrap their head around the idea of the Trinity. I don't happen to believe in the Trinity. I think the Muslims are correct in their critique of um, the Trinity and original sin. But I can mentally wrap my head around the possibility of it. And when I hear people talking about it's outrageously illogical, I don't think they're being very honest. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think there are many reasons why the Trinity idea is uh, questionable. Um, my own preferred method, which is not necessarily the Islamic method at all, it's just my own personal view, um, is that responsible mainstream historical scholarship has, I think, come to the conclusion that it's highly unlikely that Jesus thought he was God. I saw you do a, quite a long talk with somebody where you were right. saying that Paul had misrepresented Jesus. Who, who, whoever did it, uh, or, or it may not be a question of just one individual doing it, I don't think, Jesus, I don't think Paul thought... I don't think Paul believed in the Trinity either. That's, the Trinity is a later concept yeah, developed in the church. The the so so uh, it's anachronistic to attribute it to uh, any first century writer. But uh, I think the evidence is very good that the historical Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jew who practiced Judaism, uh, the Israelite religion, and did not think that he was Yahweh. Uh, there's a lot of evidence, early evidence, historical evidence suggests that's the case. So the question of the Trinity is simply not on the table when it comes to that methodology. Uh, as regards the, uh, so, so the Trinity is simply not there in Jesus' own experience. So, so it, 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 it's just out the window. But if you want to look at the doctrine in itself, I think it is incoherent because as the Athanasian... Even if God is intrinsic to reality... Well, okay, let me explain. Uh, let me think explain think how. It less incoherent with you having intrinsic... No. You think no. it's equally incoherent no matter which... Well, let, let me explain why I think it's incoherent. Because I, I don't want to be constrained by Spinoza in terms of reference here. I have my own other reasons. for nothing to do with Spinoza's concept of God. Um, in, uh, which I, I'm not sure I entirely understand either. Uh, having read Spinoza's book, Ethics, where he discusses God or nature, I'm thinking... Hmm, what are you getting at here, Spinoza? Okay, but, you're way ahead of me then. I haven't uh, read Spinoza. I've uh, read around and about. To be honest, I, wouldn't, I read it when I was doing philosophy at uni and, and I thought, I'm not impressed. Anyway, I'm, I'm, coming, okay. I'm not going to go there. Um, my own reasons for seeing the doctrine of the Trinity is in here have nothing to do with Spinoza. Uh, if we take the Athanasian Creed, for example, which is. Athanasian Creed is a 6th century creed, not actually by Athanasius, who was a 4th century do, but nevertheless, it's a creed that's recited in the Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church, in the Church of England. And it says, uh, in part, that the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is fully God. But they're not three gods, there's one God. Now, simply saying that they're not three gods but one God doesn't really satisfy me when you've already stated that the Father is fully God and the Son is fully God and the Holy Spirit is fully God and they're not the same they're distinct beings this is this is what I would call tritheism now it's not that I don't have a Spinozian understanding of metaphysics it's a simple common sense that three is not one and one is not three in that definition of the Trinity you can't have someone who you can't have three fully gods and be a monotheist. And I think Jesus was, as a good if Jew, was a monotheist. If you what? take it that literally, and I, okay, I don't believe in the Trinity. Okay? No, I know. So I'm not here to wave the flag for the Trinity. I'm not sure why we're talking about it, to be honest. If you don't well, believe it, well, I don't well, believe it. Well, <laughs> because the conversation we're having now is something else I have a far more interesting to construct it. Okay. And it's a shame that so much clickbait is hammering this. It seems to me that a lot of them. The baseline conservative Muslims are looking for the weakest arguments in Christianity yeah, and yeah. the Trinity, and they hammer that one point. And I'm not surprised. No, I, I I agree that I think that's not a great and way to do. A, it's not a great great way to do dawah. And uh, I'm as guilty as anyone because you know you, you're out to destroy your enemy, and then you talk about Islam. That's not dawah. Dawah is about calling people to the truth of Islam, not about destroying the enemy. You know, but by finding uh, arguments to undermine their faith. Uh, I mean, you can. As, you know, you can argue that Jesus is not God based on the Quran, of course, yeah. but the kind of way it's done, without regard to the whole person and sort of attacking yeah. uh, this kind of adversarial, aggressive discourse, I think is not really dour. It's, it's ego. It's ego-driven. There are some uh, good and, people and, here, though. As well. 
No, I, I'm not in any way saying I'm better than anyone else because I've done it as well no, over the years. No, so you're I'm really <laughs> good because you're aware of it and that. I yeah. respect you and I hear you're, you're respected by quite a few people here who I respect. Alhamdulillah. So you, you're much better to talk to. There are other people here I won't know. Anyway, all I'm saying is that I've made lots of mistakes and I'm uh, I'm not in any way better than anyone else. But, but um, for me, the royal road to getting the truth about the Trinity and Jesus is because of my interest in this academically, it is history. Uh, and there is a ton of evidence to suggest that Jesus didn't think he was divine at all. Uh, it happens that the Quran confirms that, and I expect it would do because the Quran is from God, but that's where I come from, and it's confirmed by revelation as well. So I had that kind of two, two pronged approach to the subject. Where I come from on this is I assume that Jesus was just a man anyway. Right. To me, because I'm a bit of a romantic or something, where I'm thinking, okay, to me that enhances the power. Okay? Yeah. To me, Superman is not an impressive character. No, indeed. Yeah. Because Superman yeah. has no fear. Superman yeah. isn't even brave. He has yeah. no fear because he's indestructible. Exactly. I think yeah. this is a very good point. It's a very good point. Christianity is yeah. that the guy is very, very vulnerable and very human. Yeah. And I look at that and then I say, Jesus, to me, exemplifies the best that human nature can do in the life he lives. Mm. He's the most exemplary example I know of. And in that respect, I call, in, mm. in that regard, I call myself a Christian. And I suspect that Christians are instinctively reacting to him at that level. Um, and then the intellectual architecture surrounding it after sometimes is on point and sometimes mm. it's off, because it's all works in progress. Mm. But um, it's a great shame to see two traditions at each other's throats as much as this over what I think is tri more trivial small print when we have so much in common. When yeah. we're blank slaters, we think it's important to work out how to live a good life. We think all people are equal, I assume, intrinsically at the soul level. At some level, yes. I don't think we're equal... In terms of abilities, no. I, I think in our access to God's grace uh, and mercy, we're all equal. Yes, at the Male and female, older. But in terms of this world, I think we're very unequal. Oh, sure. Uh, so, some people, I and mean, the Quran speaks about this, and some, God has given some people authority and status and power and other people's not. And that's part of our, our differing tests and trials in this life. But I don't think we're equal I think at, we're, at the horizontal level. I think we're very unequal. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, think, I think we're all equal as subjects right. and we're all um, unequal as objects. So we've all got different objective properties, height, strength, exactly, exactly, whatever. Exactly. So if you look at people from the outside in, clearly they're different. But it's more important to look at yeah. people from the inside out. I think religion has For Muslims, just the level of the prophets and messengers, they're not our equals. They're the, although they're just human, yeah. but they're not, I mean, you know, so the problem that Hamlet probably is will be a jewel and I'll just be a grain of sand. You know, there is a difference in quality in, in every sense. But nevertheless, we are equal in the sense of both being human before God yeah. and having access to God's mercy yeah. and access to the message of revelation. But in every other way, we're not equal. Yeah, sure. Um, but as long yeah. as we understand that that... Yeah. The divine aspect of our equality is primary and our differences are secondary. As long as you put them in a hierarchy, value hierarchy like that, you're okay. When you start making our differences supersede our fundamental commonalities and our fundamental human work, that's mm. when you get problems, I think. And we concur on that as well, yeah? More or less. <laughs> anyway, maybe a... Nice chat. No, it was. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your gracious invitation to have a conversation as well. I appreciate it. So what's your name? I forget. Tony. Tony, of course. Tony. I'm Paul. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard. I've, I've heard good things. So there's a young guy, young Muslim guy comes in, who's, I've forgotten his name now, some bad names. He's fantastic. And he was raving about you. He said he learned more from your website than he yeah, learned from but so That's misleading. Other. What he's saying is misleading. It's not me that he's learning from. It's my guests. Okay, fine. I, I, I'm not the star. The, the star of my, on, on most of my videos is some of the world's leading experts and scholars on the various subjects I talk to. It's not me, it's them. Okay, so sorry. in that sense, he's absolutely right. But it's not because it's me, it's because of the guests. We're absolutely clear. I think he meant it in that spirit. No, I mean, Good. That like, so you're like a Lex Friedman type. I mean, I really write, do you know Lex Friedman? He does a very good podcast. He's uh, an offspring of sort of Joe Rogan. He's ro risen in that camp. Oh, well, what's, what's, his, what's it called? Does he have, what's the, what, what's Lex the... Friedman. He normally does more science and computing. Uh, I know who you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. He always wears a black tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think I know what you mean. In that case, that, that would be accurate, yes. That yeah. would be true. Well, he does a great show. And he's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's got millions of followers, that guy. Yeah, because he's yeah. very high quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah, assuming yeah. you've got the same. Mm, I'm not quite at his level, but they're, 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 we're in the same ballpark, if not the same level, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to dash. Thank you very much. And you too, mate. Take Thank care. you.